welcome to the PhD session at the Clarin Annual Conference. Um, first, I will tell you a little bit about the overall aims and uh, uh, format of the session, and then the floor is given to all the students who have submitted uh, their abstract to uh, impress us uh, with their projects. A little bit about the background and the goals of the session. Um, what uh, we would like to achieve with this session is two things. First, we would like the Clarion community to learn about the next generation of research that is supported by or contributing to the Clarion infrastructure. But also, we would like to give an opportunity to PhD students in our community uh, to receive feedback on their work from our own experts from Clarin. Um, how did this session come to be? Well, before the session itself, we invited uh, PhD students to submit abstracts uh, with descriptions of uh, their PhD pro projects uh, in about 500 words. And the accepted abstracts uh, were published on the conference program webpage that you can find in the link on the slides. Um, especially, we wanted the uh, participants of this session to clearly show us how the PhD work either makes sense, uh, makes use of the Clarin infrastructure, or uh, how the results will be contributing to Clarin as a research infrastructure once the PhD uh, research is over. Uh, during the session, we will hear the presentations from the students themselves, and then the, there will be an opportunity for a, a plenary Q&A session for us all to ask questions or give comments to uh, the students. But then uh, we will also be inviting you to an in-depth discussion in uh, breakout rooms if you want to uh, engage in a discussion about a particular project in more, more detail direct, directly with the students. Um, there's also exciting uh, steps after the session. Uh, after the session, all the students will be invited to submit a full paper to be reviewed for the post-conference proceedings, giving them an opportunity uh, to appear in our volume, but also to have their research published. Uh, next uh, slide. Leon, please. This is the uh, overview of the program. Uh, each student will have five minutes to present their work. Uh, and at the end, we will have some time for questions uh, and a follow up discussion in breakout rooms. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce the first student. Uh, Victoria. Uh, she's a PhD candidate uh, in an interdisciplinary doctor program called ICT and Psychology. In her research, she tries to find linguistic markers in narratives which predict specific traumas aftermath. And she will talk about her uh, work as the first opening talk of this session. Uh, the floor is yours, Victoria. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so hi, I'm Victoria Mereszczanko-Kowszewicz, and today I want to present the result of frequency analysis with categories that include not only words, but also their meanings. At the screen, you can see the graph presenting the dependencies between different meaning categories and the influence of its appearance in the narrative about traumas. The material that I aggregate to my analysis includes narratives about trauma that happened to the people. Uh, using narrative analysis, I try to find linguistic markers of cognitive processing of trauma. After a traumatic event, a human had to integrate information from it with existing mental schemes. Experiencing difficult event shows that the world is not as safe as the individual previously thought. Usually, human struggles with oneself and re rebuilding the schemes are very hard. It is important what kind of coping stress strategy victim will choose because it influences on the traumatic event outcomes. Human can suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder or experience post-traumatic depreciation. The positive aftermath of a traumatic event is post-traumatic growth. In my research, I want to find out which kind of words meanings categories predict which aftermath. I use particular meanings of words, not words themselves. Uh, used words meanings categories are 
act acceptance, which includes meanings indicating acceptance strategy, which uh, concludes comically the terms with the situation and the reality that followed. Examples of words are reconcile, submit. Blaming uh, includes meanings indicating the attribution of blame to someone else uh, for an event, and it predicts uh, both uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and post-traumatic depreciation. Insight and causation uh, should predict uh, uh, post-traumatic growth and uh, for insight includes meanings indicating human intellectual activities related to understanding and finding the meaning of an event, and for causation, uh, meaning indicating the mental consequences of the event. I completed the first measurement in which 61 people took part in. Participants were mainly women and text corpora uh, include description of traumatic event, for example, uh, sudden death of uh, someone close, or rape. A frequency analysis was conducted in a literary exploratory, exploratory machine uh, with option own categories, which enabled users to do the analysis with their own categories. Uh, results showed that people use very frequently words from category insight and causation. For insight, a mean is 1.22, whereas for causation, 4.22. Those words, meanings, categories uh, are used very often and further research should answer the question whether those categories may be the predictors of post-traumatic growth. Uh, on the other hand, there is a category uh, which may be a predictor of uh, PTG uh, acceptance. Words, meanings, categories has for the, these categories uh, is very low because it's uh, uh, 0.02, uh, which is a very uh, low frequency of occurrence through for the whole corpus. And uh, the same case is for uh, blaming words meaning categories. Uh, and those results show either that blaming and acceptance categories should be updated with new words meanings or that words meanings categories will not be a good predictors of PTG or PTSD. I hope that within three months uh, after uh, the completion of my second measurement, uh, I will be able to answer for all the research questions and find out whether uh, all those categories uh, will be a good uh, predictor of uh, mental health uh, people uh, after the traumatic event. So thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention and uh, please welcome with all the question that appears in your head. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will not be um, breaking for questions to individual presentations, but please add your comments and questions to the chat and we can address them uh, all together at the end of the session. Um, the next presenter is Antonio, who already has a PhD in electronics and is also now a PhD student in management and business. He's a researcher in sensors, machine learning, and public health management at the University of Rome, San Rafael. Please, Antonio, uh, let's hear your presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Chair. Um, the, the study that I will show you today is an application of the machine learning techniques uh, in the healthcare uh, uh, field uh, through the voice signal, and uh, I have added uh, uh, also the handwriting signal. So these are uh, uh, results uh, published uh, in, other, uh, um, in other journals, uh, but uh, is an ongoing project to mix the, the two models. Um, the, starting from the voice signal, we could collect uh, the data from a simple smartphone and uh, a simple uh, uh, application, in this case, uh, in the Android uh, uh, software. After that, uh, we could collect uh, the data locally in the device uh, and we can redirect the data on a web platform. Uh, the graph uh, show a difference, uh, differences between a health subject and uh, an health subject. In this case, uh, we choose the Parkinson's disease that has uh, a vocal impairment uh, during the, uh, the symptoms. 
uh, we collect about 50 uh, subjects and we decide a protocol for the vocal uh, emission and also uh, for the phrases. Uh, this is, could be a problem if we choose uh, an Italian model or another language model, because the vocal is an international protocol, but uh, the phrases change uh, country by country. Uh, so in this case, uh, we obtain uh, with uh, this model, uh, with a KNN, an accuracy of uh, 97 percent that is very high uh, for our mission to distinguish healthy and unhealthy for a machine, for a software machine. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, another application of the machine learning is uh, the using of the handwriting signal. We started uh, from a chat database, uh, as uh, in the literature, and uh, we defined uh, different uh, uh, protocols uh, for the Italian phrases and also a new uh, graph protocol. Um, we obtain, uh, in this case, uh, starting from about uh, 80 subjects, so it's a lot of subjects uh, for the model, and about uh, 10 observations for each subject, uh, a, um, a lower accuracy than the literature, but we use a subset of task, only two subset, uh, a spiral for the graph part, and uh, the LE uh, for the handwriting part. Uh, in the future development, we think, uh, we hope uh, to integrate uh, these models, uh, these machine learning models, uh, starting from uh, different software uh, as Unity, MATLAB, uh, and so on, uh, into the Clary infrastructure. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is an ending slide uh, starting from the scene language uh, using a uh, wearable sensor, in this case, inertial sensor. Uh, this is due for uh, people that has uh, vocal impairment, uh, so uh, they can use only the gesture, only the finger and so on. So we can translate uh, the hand gesture, the uh, forearm movement uh, in a scene language and also in this case, we would apply the machine learning technique and we hope also to integrate in the clearing infrastructure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Again, please uh, enter your questions or comments uh, directly in chat. And in the meantime, we're moving on to Zaina. Um, she's a PhD researcher at Leeds University. And she's interested in particular in using AI techniques in the health domain. Welcome, Zainan. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, physicians usually use English uh, terminologies to write uh, records for the medical records for the patient, while government usually use our main language as Arabic. Uh, when, uh, when patients seek, for example, financial support for, to get a treatment for their disease uh, from the government, uh, the government will require them to provide the Arabic translation for the medical reports. And this uh, project, I aim at to start, with, start the project with building Arabic English for our medical corpora of reliable resources to improve the translation of uh, medical text. Medical text has many issues. For example, the terminologies, uh, it is hard the, to uh, specify a specific, uh, there is inconsistency in uh, medical terminologies in Arabic. Also, the structure of the text itself is a difficulty and uh, uh, last thing, when they use Google Translator, they will not get uh, good translation. So as I said, the aim is to build an open access for all English Arabic corpus of medical text that is employed in approving a specific domain word alignments or specific domain translation. We will collect uh, open access uh, medical text from reliable resources such as World Health Organization, our Minister of Health, then we will align the corpus at document, sentence, and word level. 
We will also will extract a lexicon of English Arabic medical terminology since there is no an open access lexicon of English Arabic medical terminology that can be used directly in NLP research. This corpus will be published into a clarion infrastructure. Here I'm stating the research questions, how much data I can collect for the corpus. It has uh, approximated uh, to about 1,500,000 uh, uh, words. Uh, what kind of annotations are required? Uh, I think I will need the uh, uh, document, uh, sorry, topic annotation and sentence annotation beside medical terms annotation. Uh, I need also to evaluate uh, the current alignment tools, how they align the different align the different types of terminologies, one word to one word, one word to many words. For example, maybe one medical term in English could be translated into several words in Arabic, uh, multi words to one word and multiple words in English that is translated into multiple words in Arabic. Uh, here also the last question, is it possible to use linguistic feature to improve the alignment? Here in the example, I'm adding one uh, medical terminology in English and how to use morphology to translate it into Arabic into several uh, uh, words. For example, bronchodilators, there are about uh, 2000 medical terms with that format where two words are connected with a vowel letter O, and that could be used uh, as a morphology way to improve the translation by knowing the basic words for the medical terms and translate it to Arabic. Here only I'm stating the creating purpose steps. We are taking the text from the web, crawling the web, then we will use tools to align, to align these documents and do parsing and so on. Uh, I'm also using uh, uh, the syntax dependency tree to identify multi-word Arabic medical terms. As I said before, there is no lexicon to do so. Uh, then I will apply a segmentor seeker, fragment seeker in semantic tightness continuum. So this is only a plan for the project. I haven't actually started this implementation. I only started collecting data. Thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Zainab. Um, please enter your questions and comments in chat. Uh, and we will now be moving on to the next presentation, which will be done by Fabio, who has recently defended his PhD at the University of Pisa and University of Aix-Marseille. Uh, he's now a postdoc uh, fellow at the University of Siena. His research interests uh, focus on migrant communities of sociolinguistics, oral archives and the link between language attitudes and second language acquisition. The floor is yours, Fabio. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I briefly explain here my PhD project, Attitudes and Language Acquisition, an investigation on the Italian-French community in Aix-Marseille that they developed in joint supervision between the universities of Pisa and Aix-Marseille. Uh, as suggested by the title, the aim of the project is to explore the influence exerted by the psychosocial constructs uh, known as social attitudes on the spontaneous development of a second language in a migrant community. The hypothesis of the study is that better attitudes toward the host community and negative attitudes toward the L1 community led to a more native-like development of the L2. The study hypothesis is tested on a sample of 15 bilingual Italian native informants migrated to the French area of Provence uh, in their early adulthood and having similar personal characteristics. Moreover, the participants are selected to fulfill specific linguistic traits, as for instance, to be spontaneous learners of French and to have the same Italian variety, the Campanian Italian as mother tongue. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, particular attention has been devoted to the development of the data collection protocol of the study, uh, mediating between uh, classical and more up-to-date uh, linguistic and social psychological approaches. As to gather data about the psychological and social construct, uh, um, specific methods have been borrowed and adapted from the psychosocial field. In detail, three constructs have been considered in the study, namely the explicit attitudes, completely conscious and collected through a like-at-like -like questionnaire, 
the implicit attitudes largely unconscious and investigated using an EAT, implicit association test protocol, and the empathy, a predictor of both attitudes, which psychometry have been assessed using an empathy quotient test. A second data collection phase specifically focuses on the construction of a speech corpus representing the two varieties spoken by the informants, namely the Italian L1 and the French L2. Early in the design process, the social resource was intended to have the largest experimental exploitability and reusability, and to contain speech in their most spontaneous or at least semi-spontaneous form. Uh, with design in mind, the two distinct protocols were adopted for each of the considered languages. The French speech was collected adopting a picture task protocol. Uh, the informants were exposed to 55 distinct pictures with the request to freely describe it. Uh, the full task was developed within the speech recorder software. Uh, using this approach, more than two hours of French were collected. A more in-depth method was used to collect uh, the Italian speech. Using a modular Laborian interview, the participants were left free to switch between a number of topics regarding their experience and their condition of uh, Italian migrants in France. Evidently, this approach was adopted with the secondary goal of obtaining, in addition to the linguistic data, a specific personal and social knowledge about the informants. In this sense, the corpus, originally developed for linguistic research, strives to represent a useful source for other disciplinary fields, like oral history and social studies. As for the French, about two, hour, two hours of Italian speech have been collected uh, using this method. Next slide, please. Uh, the analysis uh, carried out on the collected data sets partly confirmed the hypothetical, the hypothetical statement, revealing how only explicit attitudes directly affect L2 acquisition. The future development of the study uh, mainly regards the data sets described here. First of all, I plan to expand the corpus to produce a more representative research, oral resource to perform linguistic, historical, and sociological research on the Italian migrants in France. And for the same reason, a full literal and phonetic description of the corpus is planned. And finally, to fulfill the aspiration of maximal accessibility and reusability of the collected datasets, their integration with the declared infrastructure is, is planned in the near future. And I conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. I already see some questions in the chat for uh, previous presenters. Uh, please continue to do the same with uh, presentations heard so far. And uh, in the meantime, we'll be moving on uh, to Noemi. She also just recently defended her uh, thesis. Uh, she's a computational linguist and is mainly interested in corpus design and corpus building. She works at the Hungarian Research Center for Linguistics in Budapest. Please, Noemi, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about uh, adverbia roles in Hungarian and their precise detection in a corpus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before turning to the motivation of my research, I have to know that uh, I am talking about Hungarian. And uh, uh, it is important to know that Hungarian is agglutinative language and uh, many of the syntactic information is stored in the suffixes of the words or um, yes, and not in the word order or in prefixes as in, in English, for example. The background of my research presented here is a question answering system designed for Hungarian and more specifically the design of a training corpus for such a question answering system. Uh, with a question answering system, our goal is to formulate the relevant questions of a given chunk of a sentence. And with the training corpus, the goal is to provide the appropriate information and annotation for the system. So any model taught on this corpus will be able to ask the proper question and to find the proper answer for a given question. Uh, why is it difficult? Uh, let us look at the examples here, London Bon and Nadrag Bon. London bon in Hungarian means in London, and the suffix bon bears the locative information here. If we see in London, we know uh, that the appropriate question is where, or on the other way around, to the question where in London may be a proper answer. Uh, on the other hand, not drag one in pants looks like the same. We see the same locative case suffix on the stem bon, or the same preposition in in English. But the question here cannot be where, but rather how, in what clothes. 
uh, or on the other way around to the question where in pants is not the proper answer. So uh, the goal can be formulated as uh, follows. We want to categorize the roles of adverbial adjuncts in the sentence. As a first step, I focused on the nine locative case suffixes in Hungarian. The data I used was retrieved from the Szeged Dependency Tree Bank. Uh, I collected all the tokens which were annotated as oblique. Um, I'm looking for adjuncts and not arguments of the verbs. Additionally, I searched for tokens with the above mentioned nine locative case suffixes. Next slide, please. Um, as a result, I defined 28 adverbial roles these tokens may have in a sentence. Um, and as I found more than a thousand tokens in the corpus, um, I uh, sorted them into the categories I defined. Uh, besides the default category, each lemma and suffix pair could receive one or more additional roles tag if necessary. So here is an example table of the results. Um, I only show you three words with three suffixes, but uh, uh, there are altogether nine locative case suffixes in this uh, study. Uh, so first look at the word cur, meaning circle. Uh, its default category is mode, so it's basically a mode adverb. It means that if you see this word in the corpus with a locative case suffix, it almost always answers to the question how. It's a mode adverb. But there is an additional role. If this word cur bears the inactive case suffix in Hungarian, then it is not, it's not only a mode adverb answering to the question how, but also a locative adverb answering to the question where. Uh, the second word here is uh, gondozás, caretaking. Uh, the basic category of this word is a uh, thing, which only means that this word has not, does not have a special adverbial role, but only answers to the questions in what, on what, to what, uh, depending on the case suffix it bears. But with the inactive case suffix, it may be a form adverb answering to the question in what form. And finally, let us take a look at level letter, which is a form adverb by default, answering to the question in what form. But when bearing a superassive case suffix, it is a locative adverb answering to the question where. So next slide, please. Um, the interesting question is, uh, whether there are any universal roles among these suffixes and prepositions. Um, for example, uh, if you, we take a look at the first example, not drag one in pants, um, uh, not drag one, not drag with the inactive case suffix answers to the question in what clothes or how. And in English, in pants also answers to these questions. Uh, so the question is, uh, are these uh, things, the preposition in and the suffix bon parallel? And um, is there a universal role among uh, other languages as well? Um, and besides, uh, other suffixes in Hungarian must be uh, investigated as well to, uh, this, uh, uh, to uh, discover uh, other adverbial roles in the corpus. And finally, these categories have to be transformed to a proper annotation scheme to be able to provide a good training data uh, for a question answering system. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I already see activity in chat, both re uh, regarding questions and answers. Um, we will be addressing them uh, very shortly, but before that, we still have two presentations to uh, listen to. Uh, the next one is going to be done by Alina. She's a second year PhD student at the University of Lille. She's working under the supervision of Associate Professor Eva Soroli, who is the new Clarion Ambassador, on the cognitive implications of L2 and L3 acquisition from a psycholinguistic perspective. Alina, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. So good afternoon and thank you for being here. Today I will present a part of my PhD thesis on tough constructions and their analogs in English, French and Russian. This is a use case, a, a comparative work using a parallel corpus extracted from the Clarion VLO platform with some important typological implications. Next slide, please. First, let me clarify what is a tough construction. We talk about the use of tough constructions in languages that offer the possibility to use a specific class of, pred of predicates, such as easy, difficult, tough, within a construction where the syntactic subject, as in the example 1a, this road is also an object of the infinitive to cross. So here in 1a and 1b, 
in English and in French, we see that the adjective difficult is applied to the whole infinitive sentence leaving a gap. We call such constructions tough constructions and this particular encoding strategy a gap strategy. Despite the common strategy among English and French, English offers an additional variant, the tough not constructions, where the tough adjective is not a subject complement, but a modifier to the head noun of the matrix, used attributively in pronominal position as in example 2a. In contrast, such a construction is ungrammatical in French, like uh, in the example 2b. The problem is that there is no direct equivalent of tough constructions or tough not constructions in Russian. Some researchers describe this language as a system without tough movement per se, but with functional analogs to, to the English tough construction that mark explicitly typicalization of the noun phrase, for example, in the accusative case, followed by impersonal expressions, uh, expressions and dependent infinitives in perfective or imperfective forms, like in example 3a. Others su su suggest three additional constructions, prepositional phrase verbals with the use of na, for, plus a verbal 3b, and two passive constructions involving adverbal tough modifiers. So in other words, in this language, speakers need to say something like, this road with difficulty can be crossed, or this road is with difficulty crossable. Next slide, please. The main aims of the present study was first to find the correspondence among English, French, and Russian, then to identify any across or within system variation, and finally to check the accuracy of previous typological classifications. From the 39 multilingual corpus accessible in the Clarion infrastructure, we chose to work with the Opus corpus. This data set provides sentence aligned data which allowed for direct comparisons. More, more specifically, we, we focused our research on the subtitle subcorpus and then selected as a source language English and, tar and target languages French and Russian. For the purposes of this exploratory study, we analyzed only the adjectives difficult and easy. In total, 6,530 clauses were extracted, then annotated manually to distinguish among non tough constructions, extra post constructions, tough constructions, and tough nut constructions. The detailed annotation procedure allowed us to extract from the whole corpus 377 target segments, which were further analyzed for direct comparison with French and the equivalent structures in Russian. Next slide, please. The results showed that although English and French both offer the possibility for gap strategies in tough constructions, French additionally allows for a multiply of other analogs, for example, extra post constructions, compact adjectival uses, etc., that, co that coexist with typical tough constructions. With respect to Russian, also some researchers support that this language offers mainly typicalization of their noun phrase with case marking and alternatively pass uh, passive and verbal strategies. Our, fi our findings only partially support this use and shed light to the great richness of the functional analogs the system offers. The present research is one of the rare cases of corpus investigation in the domain of tough constructions. It offers detailed annotation principles in three languages that help identify tough constructions in corpora and which we believe is a rare contribution to the Claren infrastructure. In addition, the results are useful for the, for the domain of translation studies, as well as in the foreign language teaching and learning with great implications for the, co for the cognitive studies. For the future, we plan to explore the corpus in the opposite direction with sources languages like Russian and French. Uh, also, we uh, plan to correct to collect oral data for a deep investigation of each language separately, and finally to go beyond language use and explore to what extent such variability influences the nonverbal behavior of the speakers in monolingual, bilingual, and trilingual contexts. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have uh, our final speaker of the day, uh, Erika. 
Uh, she's a PhD student from the University of Pavia in Italy, and her supervisor is Professor Silvia Luraghi. For her PhD, uh, she worked on the annotation of a new tree bank of Vedic Sanskrit at, uh, as part of a project that uh, took place at the University of Zurich, uh, where she in particular analyzed different strategies of encoding comparison. The floor is yours, Erika. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. My PhD project uh, is now coming to an end. I will submit my thesis next month. Uh, it was devoted to the annotation of the Rig Veda uh, and to the study uh, of its equative and simulative construction. The Rig Veda is a collection of uh, about 1000 imps, uh, which date back to the second half of the second millennium BCE and, co and constitute the oldest layer of Vedic Sanskrit literature. Um, this project uh, um, was relevant for uh, uh, the Clary infrastructure for two main reasons. The first one is the addiction of another language to the uh, universal de dependency family. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, the Vedic treatment was annotated according to the UD scheme. And although the annotation was carried out uh, uh, in the digital corpus of Sanskrit interface uh, uh, developed by Elvig, um, it was published uh, um, in, uh, in the universal dependencies uh, um, um, infrastructure uh, in May 2020. A second and third uh, version of the of the tree bank is now going to be released uh, um, uh, next month probably. Um, um, before the project, indeed, there was only a small tree bank of classical Sanskrit, uh, which was the result of a pilot project on uh, about uh, 250 sentences from the Panchatanta. And uh, uh, besides not being uh, um, a really meaningful test for the purpose of uh, uh, linguistic research in historic in, uh, in European studies, uh, uh, it was also a very small corpus. Uh, now, with uh, the Vedic tree bank project and another project which is going on at the University of Dusseldorf, which is called the Cron BMM, uh, we reach an amount of about 3,000 sentences uh, from the Rig Veda alone uh, and more than uh, 8,000 8, sentences uh, from uh, the whole corpus of Vedic Sanskrit literature. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the second um, reason for which uh, this project might be uh, relevant for the current infrastructure and more specifically for universal dependencies is that it was uh, centered on the annotation of comparative construction, which uh, um, for those uh, who are uh, uh, confident with uh, universal dependencies know that uh, it was a hot topic uh, in uh, universal dependency workshop uh, and, uh, and discussions. Um, I was interested uh, in a particular type of uh, uh, comparative construction, with our, uh, which are equative and simulative construction marked by three particles, which are Na, Eva, and Yadam. And uh, I had three main research questions, which were um, dealt with their origin, their synchronic syntax, syntax and further development that uh, we can uh, observe uh, in the later Sanskrit um, literature. Um, however, um, uh, while I was approaching uh, uh, the, the, the annotation, um, two, uh, two main problems came out, that is that comparison is, is expressed by several other strategies uh, in Vedic, and that the three particles uh, have other functions too. So I needed a more um, granular and uh, informative annotation scheme. So I decided to adopt the uh, universal dependency annotation scheme for uh, uh, comparison and to extend it with subrelations. Uh, crucially, uh, crucially in, in my opinion, uh, um, these subrelations are not meant to be language specific, but could be uh, employed for uh, uh, whichever language uh, and by with, um, whoever is interested in the investigation of comparative construction, also cross linguistically. Uh, here, I, I, I inserted some exa example in, in the English translation. Uh, and my main uh, purpose was to distinguish between uh, uh, basic or syntagmatic comparison and the closer comparison, and also uh, between uh, uh, credible and non-credible non uh, adjectives, that is between uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, um, comparison. Uh, 
So since I'm an, uh, at the end of my PhD pro, uh, project, I can say that uh, this more granular and informative annotation uh, uh, return uh, new insight uh, uh, on the three uh, research questions, uh, specifically on the origin of this construction, on their synchronic syntax. Uh, indeed, I was able to observe that the, the order of standard and parameter, and, and parameter in the um, uh, comparative construction is, is determined by a series of factors. And finally, I was able to um, observe the development of one of the three particles, Eva, into an adapter in the late, in later text. Uh, however, there is still a question which I would, I would like to uh, address, um, uh, which is the development of Eva uh, and its expansion at the expense of the particle now, which will, be, will uh, disappear in later text. Uh, this, uh, uh, however, could not be done uh, simply by querying the tree bank because uh, uh, we need to account also for uh, uh, semantics uh, of the standard, that is of the semantics of the, the word preceding the particle. Um, and so my aim uh, um, for uh, after my PhD uh, would be to enrich uh, uh, the information contained in the tree bank, uh, uh, employing the conlu plus uh, format, and to insert it in a further column of the conlu file, uh, since that there is a semantic information uh, um, extracted from the Sanskrit WordNet, which is a linguistic research that is being developed at the University of Pavia and Exeter. And with this, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes uh, the presentations for this year's uh, PhD session. And it's now time for a short uh, plenary Q&A session. Uh, so I will try to address uh, the more general questions that might be relevant for more than one presenter and for as much of the audience as possible. So the first question from Dario um, is for Zaina and uh, anyone else who might feel uh, is relevant uh, for this topic as well. Um, medical corpora are particularly sensitive to uh, privacy issues. Have you had any? How did you uh, collect your documents and uh, what are your, um, uh, ex what's your experience with uh, privacy issues? Uh, well, I'm collecting educational uh, medical texts uh, from, uh, for example, the whole organization. Uh, the privacy of organization allow uh, the reuse of the educational content from their website. But for example, my Ministry of Health uh, doesn't uh, allow that unless you will obtain a permission from them. So it, it is different from one website to another. Many thanks. This is uh, even more complex if we do uh, transnational research where uh, legislation and privacy issues uh, differ country to country. Let's now uh, move to uh, Fabio's talk. Um, again, a question from Dario. Um, how did you uh, define the composition of the uh, Italian migrants that you interviewed, how, how did you select your sample? Okay, the, well, the sample is roughly classifiable as a, a sample of cultural migrants. So uh, subjects uh, having a high, uh, high polarization and migrated to France uh, to find the uh, workplaces in line uh, with their ambitions. Uh, this is evidently an aspect taken into account in the study. Uh, there are 15 informants with an age range between 28 and 31 years old. They are balanced for sex and are recruited in, in particular with uh, word to mount method. So, uh, for uh, this is uh, all. Thank you. Uh, are they balanced for sex so that you have 50-50 in your sample or balanced with respect to what is the re re realistic situation in terms of gender distribution among, among migrants? 50-50. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and a final question uh, from Juliana to Alina. Um, we were able to see that you used uh, the VLO for your research. Uh, can you please share your experience with VLO uh, to the uh, participants of this session? Yes, of course. So uh, in general, it was a very great experience because uh, at first it was very much challenging because I had to find the trilingual corpus, which wasn't very easy when you have uh, three languages 
like English, French, and Russian, whether this languages are very much used. And uh, I was very happy that I had the access to several uh, corpuses, and I ha even have uh, the several examples, but I, I was much more fancied by the opus corpus, which is also enormous and very much interesting to use. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to conclude the Q&A session.